Tonight, firm warnings. Biden begins to bargain with baby. Harsher conditionalities are communicated on Israel's inaction on the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Enduring ties. NATO celebrates 75 years of long-standing partnership in the midst of the Ukraine war. The bloc now gearing up to defend against Russian assault directly. Trump turned down. Twin legal losses for the former president as judges spurned his calls to dismiss his insurrection charges. And climate for coffee. Care to understand exactly how much plants can tell us about the world? All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight on the final bulletin for this week. And as we prepare to wind down over the weekend, we have for you a packed rundown filled with key updates from across the globe. Starting off with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now, President Joe Biden threatened to condition support for Israel's offensive in Gaza on it by taking concrete steps to protect aid workers and civilians, seeking for the first time to leverage U.S. aid to influence Israeli military behavior. Biden's warning follows an Israeli airstrike that killed seven aid workers and was relayed during a phone call on Thursday with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We've gone from a hug to a handshake to a slap on the wrist today. Laura Blumingfeld, a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, said it marks the first time Biden has sought to leverage U.S. aid to influence Israeli military behavior. Look, this is tough. It's Biden on a tightrope with no net. He's caught in political crosswinds. From the left wing of his party, they're saying condition aid, you know, remove yourself from your, your all-out support for Israel. And then from the right, especially in Congress, um, the Republicans are threatening to blast him because they'll, they'll accuse him of weakness. I think the most important thing here is to set clear red lines. So if Biden can say, here are the lines, do not cross them, there will be consequences, that gives him credibility and leverage and leadership. The White House had described Biden as outraged by the attack that killed World Central Kitchen aid workers. Systematically, car by car. The group's founder, celebrity chef Jose Andres, told that the attack had targeted his aid workers deliberately. Israel must meet this moment. In Brussels, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the attack on aid workers this week must be the last and that humanitarian aid must be surged into Gaza. If we don't see the changes that we need to see, there'll be changes in our own policy. At the White House, spokesperson John Kirby declined to elaborate on what specific changes the U.S. would make to its policy toward Israel and Gaza but said the U.S. expected to see an announcement from Israel on steps it's taking to protect civilians and aid workers in the coming hours and days. Uh, we want to see that, uh, that uh, even as the Israelis work through their investigation, that they are willing and able to take practical, immediate steps to protect aid workers on the ground and to demonstrate uh, that, they, that they have that civilian harm mitigation in place. Israel said on Thursday it would adjust tactics in the Gaza war after describing the attack as the result of a misidentification and that findings from an investigation would be made public soon. And now some updates on the devastating quakes over in Taiwan. Workers in Taiwan's Hualien City began dismantling a building tilted over by this week's earthquake. It had been slanting precariously since the 7.2 magnitude tremor struck, killing at least a dozen people. Workers in Taiwan's Hualien City began dismantling a building tilted over by this week's earthquake. It had been slanting precariously since the 7.2 magnitude tremor struck, killing at least a dozen people. Earlier in the day, locals gathered in front of the 10-story Uranus building with flowers, fruit and joss paper to pray for the safe demolition. Rescue workers on Friday, meanwhile, continued to search for 18 people still missing after what was the island's biggest earthquake in at least 25 years. The mayor of Hualien told three foreigners of Australian and Canadian nationality are among those missing. Dozens of aftershocks have rattled the disaster zone with those who had been cut off and unable to leave gradually taken to safety. 
A memorial service was held on Friday for victims of the quake. Buddhist monks were seen at a local funeral parlor chanting in front of pictures of the deceased placed on an altar. The quake struck a day before Taiwan began a long weekend holiday for the traditional tomb sweeping festival, a time when tourists visit scenic spots like Hualien to enjoy its natural beauty. And now an enduring allyship continues as NATO ministers celebrated their 75th anniversary of their alliance with flags, cake and marching bands, while its Secretary General reminded the United States that it needed its allies more than ever as the Ukraine war enters its third year. Today we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the strongest, most enduring, and most uh, successful alliance in history. NATO has been marking its founding with cake, a marching band and speeches. But celebrations were overshadowed, with Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg reminding the United States that its allies needed more help than ever as Russia's war in Ukraine enters its third year. Europe needs America for its security. Fair burden sharing is essential. And Europe is investing more, much more. This year, the majority of NATO allies will invest at least 2% of their GDP in defense. At the same time, North America also needs Europe. European allies provide world-class militaries, vast intelligence networks, and unique diplomatic leverage, multiplying America's might. For the past two days, NATO foreign ministers have been meeting in Brussels, where the alliance's 32 members agreed to step up coordinating military aid for Ukraine in what is Europe's biggest conflict since World War II. But many are anxious about NATO's future. Part of this anxiety stems from the possibility of former US President Donald Trump beating incumbent President Joe Biden in November. But it is also about the ongoing hold-up to the stalled $60 billion Ukraine aid package in Congress, as Republicans demand border security measures in return for passing the bill. Also in attendance during the two-day meeting was Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, who continued to press the alliance for further air defences. This treaty is a simple document. NATO was founded on April 4th, 1949. It began with just 12 members from North America and Europe and was created to provide collective security against the Soviet Union. At the heart of the alliance is collective defense, the idea that an attack on one member is considered to be an attack on all, giving US military protection to Western Europe. Now, as NATO celebrates their enduring partnership, the Kremlin continues to cry foul. Russia and NATO are now in direct confrontation, the Kremlin said, as the US-led alliance marked its 75th anniversary. NATO's successive waves of Eastern enlargement are a fixation of President Vladimir Putin, who went to war in Ukraine two years ago with the stated aim of preventing the alliance from coming closer to Russia's borders. For more on this, we have other day on the World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli, what's the latest? Yes, Anuradi. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov stated that in fact relations have now slipped to the level of direct confrontation. Putin has repeatedly said that Russia was cheated by the West in the aftermath of the Cold War as Moscow's Warsaw Pact alliance was disbanded but NATO moved eastwards by taking in former Pact members and the three Baltic states that had been part of the Soviet Union. The West rejects that version saying NATO is a defensive alliance and joining it was a democratic choice by countries that had shaken off decades of communist rule. NATO says it is helping Ukraine fight for its survival in the face of Russian aggression and has provided Kyiv with advanced weapons, training and intelligence. Russia says that makes NATO de facto a party to the conflict. Putin said in February that a direct conflict between Russia and NATO would mean the planet was one step away from the World War III. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. 
Tech theft is becoming far more common and on a far larger scale. A man in China who worked for Google allegedly stole information on an artificial intelligence project that took more than a decade to develop. The suspect and his lawyer refused to comment after the FBI searched his home and seized his electronic devices. The worst case scenario for an American company and the stuff of spy thrillers. A Chinese national accused of stealing America's latest crown jewel in tech, artificial intelligence. But it's not fiction and it just happened to Google. We've unsealed an indictment against a Chinese national. Lin Wei Ding was one of many Chinese nationals and other immigrants who play an important role working on cutting edge technology at the tech giant. Prosecutors say Ding secretly uploaded more than 500 Google files containing AI secrets, ironically, to his personal cloud account. According to experts like Cornell computer science professor Bart Selman, the AI technology took more than a decade to develop. In 2022 and 2023, prosecutors say he spent four months in China working with two PRC-based firms and raising money to create his own artificial intelligence company while another Google employee used his badge to make it seem as if he was clocking into work in California. The day before prosecutors say Ding was to board a one-way flight from San Francisco back to China on January 7th, the FBI searched his home, seizing his electronic devices. Ding and his lawyer declined to comment. In a statement, Google said it has strict safeguards to prevent the theft of our confidential commercial information and trade secrets, and thank the FBI for its help. In fact, just two weeks after Ding's arrest, the Justice Department charged two other men with stealing Tesla trade secrets in order to set up their own electric vehicle company in China. The Chinese government vehemently denies carrying out any theft of intellectual property. But FBI Director Christopher Wray calls it the defining threat of our generation. Today, and literally every day, they're actively attacking our economic security, engaging in wholesale theft of our innovation and our personal and corporate data. While Lin Wei Ding allegedly lifted the AI technology, and it could be in the hands of his associates in China, he won't be cashing in. Instead, he's charged with four counts of theft of trade secrets. He pled not guilty, but could face up to 10 years in prison. We're going in for a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We continue with updates on Trump's legal troubles tonight. Donald Trump suffered a pair of legal setbacks as judges spurned his calls to dismiss criminal charges over the former U.S. president's efforts to overturn his 2020 loss in Georgia and is keeping classified records after leaving office. So that we can discuss Donald Trump suffered twin legal setbacks on Thursday with judges in separate states rejecting Trump's bids to dismiss criminal charges against him. Florida-based U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, rejected Trump's argument that the case accusing him of illegally holding on to classified documents should be thrown out. Trump argued that a law called the Presidential Records Act gave him the ability to decide what papers he kept as personal documents. Prosecutors have said the law should play no role in the trial. They argue the documents relate to U.S. military and intelligence matters, including details about the American nuclear program, and could not be construed as personal. And earlier in the day, a Georgia judge rejected Trump's bid to dismiss criminal charges in the state's 2020 election interference case against him, which Trump argued violate his free speech rights. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee found that the statements by Trump and others alleged in the indictment were made, quote, in furtherance of criminal activity and are not protected by the Constitution. A lawyer for Trump in the Georgia case said Trump and his co-defendants disagree with the ruling. Trump has been criminally charged in four cases as he challenges Democratic President Joe Biden in the November election and has delayed trials in three of the four. The first ever trial of a sitting or former U.S. president is set to get underway in New York on April 15th. It's unclear if any of the other cases will reach a jury before the November election.
And on the road to the White House tonight, some moves on deterrence are practiced by the U.S. government. President Joe Biden again warned Chinese President Xi Jinping against meddling in the November U.S. presidential election during the two leaders' phone call. The call is part of U.S. efforts to maintain open lines of communication to responsibly manage competition and prevent unintended conflict. In various engagements, the U.S. has raised its continual reinforcement of concern against Chinese election interference. Biden last raised this issue in his meeting with Xi in Woodside, California, last November. Beijing has repeatedly said it has no interest in meddling in U.S. internal affairs. A declassified U.S. intelligence threat assessment released in February warned of Beijing's higher degree of sophistication in its influence activity, including by using generative AI. The report warned of growing efforts to actively exploit perceived U.S. societal divisions online. Liu Pingyu, a spokesperson for the Chinese embassy in Washington, said in a statement that China is committed to the principle of non-interference and their claims about Beijing influencing U.S. presidential elections are completely fabricated. The climate concerns continue to rack up across the globe. Weather forecasters at Colorado State University predicted an extremely active 2024 Atlantic hurricane season because of warm sea surface temperatures and less wind shear to break up storms in the summer and fall. Weather forecasters at Colorado State University on Thursday predicted a, quote, extremely active 2024 Atlantic hurricane season, citing warm sea surface temperatures and less wind shear to break up storms in the summer and fall. The forecast sees 23 named storms, including 11 total hurricanes, five of which are projected to be major hurricanes with winds above 111 miles per hour. CSU also said there was a, quote, well above average probability for major hurricanes making landfall, along the continental United States coastline and in the Caribbean. An average hurricane season produces 14 named storms, of which seven lead to hurricanes and three become major cyclones. Last year saw 20 named storms and seven total hurricanes, three of which were major. The most damaging, Adalia, tore up the west coast of Florida and made landfall as a Category 3 hurricane. The CSU forecast is closely monitored by coastal communities and energy companies which base much of their crude oil and natural gas production, as well as oil refinery along the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. And Thursday's forecast is in line with other initial outlooks. Last week, AccuWeather said there was a 10 to 15 percent chance of 30 or more named storms this hurricane season, which runs from June through November. And the UN Human Rights Council has once again put the spotlight on the human rights situation in North Korea, passing a resolution for the 22nd year in a row. Pyongyang accused the West of fabricating issues inside the regime. The United Nations Human Rights Council has passed a resolution addressing human rights issues in North Korea for the 22nd consecutive year. The Council unanimously approved the resolution without a vote during its 55th session at the UN office in Geneva on Thursday. China, Cuba and Eritrea opted out the session, citing concerns about double standards on the resolution. The resolution strongly condemns North Korea's systematic violations of human rights and calls for urgent reforms. This year's resolution includes updates that reflect the South Korean government's concerns, including those urging Pyongyang to abolish or amend its laws that limit the freedom of thought, religion and expression. It also strengthens clauses related to North Korea's fulfillment of its obligations under international human rights treaties. Another significant addition to this year's resolution is the request for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to prepare a comprehensive report on the human rights situation in North Korea. This request comes a decade after the publication of the 2014 UN Commission of Inquiry report on North Korean human rights. The resolution also calls for North Korea to join key human rights treaties, such as the Convention Against Torture, and to honor its commitments to the international human rights conventions it is already a part of. Following the adoption, North Korea expressed strong objection, accusing the West of fabricating human rights issues in the regime. 
Meanwhile, South Korea's foreign ministry expressed its approval on Thursday, welcoming the decision and reaffirming its commitment to addressing North Korean human rights issues on an international level. And on the doctor walkouts in South Korea, talks between President Yoon suk yeol and protesting junior doctors failed to secure a breakthrough in the current standoff. In fact, pundits believe the interaction simply served to reaffirm their differences. It seems there's no breakthrough in the medical reform dispute. Thursday's meeting between President Yoon suk and the head of the Korean Intern and Resident Association ended without any notable progress. Following the more than two hours long meeting, the presidential office said the government will respect what trainee doctors say, while Park Dan, the head of the KIRA, posted on his social media that there is no future for medicine in South Korea. Prime Minister Han Dok Su stated on Friday that the dialogue has just about begun, mentioning the government's will for reforming the healthcare field. The health ministry also said in the same day's briefing that the government is engaging in talks, urging trainee doctors to return to the hospitals. The president, prime minister and health ministers are making every effort to engage in sincere dialogue with the medical community. The government urges them to cease collective actions and come forward to the discussion table openly. The government's emergency medical system to address health care shortages is still ongoing. The government has extended the deployment period of military surgeons and public health doctors by an additional month, starting from Thursday. And 47 more medical institutions have been added to those designated to support severe and cancer patients. Also, a majority of medical school professors who submitted resignation letters or declared reduced working hours are still staying at their positions at hospitals. The medical dispute began with the government's plan to increase the number of medical school admission slots by 2,000. The government maintains the firm stance that 15,000 more doctors will be needed by 2035 due to the rapidly aging population. However, the medical community says that with the continuous decline in birth rates, there may not be a shortage of doctors in the future. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. But humans continue to try and find even more creative means in effectively fighting climate change. Researchers are now wiring up coffee plants with solar-powered sensors in Tanzania in a bid to understand how climate change is affecting the health of Arabica coffee plants in the region. How can you tell if a coffee plant is suffering from the effects of climate change? Just listen to it. That's the hope of researchers who are wiring up coffee plants with solar-powered sensors in Tanzania. At Utengule Coffee Farm, researchers are monitoring 20 Arabica coffee plants that are wired up across the plantation. Each plant is attached to electrodes that monitor it. Using Internet of Things technology developed by Cisco, these wired plants will provide researchers with continuous updates on their health and hydration. The project is being run by the Italian Espresso Research Center, Academia del Caffè Espresso, alongside PNAT, a think tank of designers and plant scientists. Tanzania, a major coffee producer, is already feeling the effects of climate change with unpredictable rainfall and extended droughts. The Wired Up Coffee Plans project in Tanzania is the first time sensor-based technology has been deployed in a coffee plantation. According to researchers at the Academia del Café Espresso, they hope information gathered from the wired up coffee plants and their surroundings could potentially benefit not only coffee growers around the world, but farmers of other crops who are trying to counter the effects of climate change. And finally tonight, archaeologists are having a field day, literally, over in France, with the discovery of an extremely ancient castle under what was supposed to be the site of a museum. The discovery was one for the history books. Take a look. A 640-year-old castle was found underneath a French hotel. 
archaeologists from the National Institute of Preventative Archaeological Research said they knew ruins of this castle existed somewhere, but didn't have the details until construction started on a new fine arts museum. Chateau de l'Hermine in Vence, France was built in the 1380s. It was created to be a fortress for Jean IV, then Duke of Brittany. It had exceptionally thick walls to ward off any invaders. Less than 100 years later, the chateau was abandoned. The last purchase records for the Chateau de l'Hermine go back to 1784. It was destroyed, and a mansion that later functioned as a hotel and government building stood in its place. But the chateau was not fully destroyed, merely built over. In the spring of 2023, when archaeologists began excavating the site, they found walls, staircases, and even a moat that were well intact. They also found details of daily life, like pottery, utensils, jewelry, and coins. Officials haven't said what will be done with the Chateau de l'Hermine site once the excavation is done. You know, it really begs the question, how much more will we find if we continue to explore under the Earth's surface? Well, that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News, wrapping up the week. We'll be with you once more on Monday to bring you key updates from across the globe. Till then, have a restful weekend. Good night.